Um, hey guys, obviously everyone should know that Shadowlands is releasing pretty soon, as you can see by the pretty timer on the bottom of the screen. So um, we thought we'd do a catch out and discuss all the things that we have to discuss just before Shadowlands releases. It's just me and Zan again. Um, we've got a big list of things to talk about, obviously starting with the main thing that's probably on people's minds, which is Covenants. Um, yeah. So we might as well talk about Convoke first, because that was changed recently. The Night Fae Covenant ability, yep, Night for Fae anyone Fae. who's not in loop. Yeah. Convoke the Spirits. So, previously to the change, Convoke the Spirits cast 12 spells, eight of which were supposed to be form-specific, and four of which was supposed to be sort of general spells, so healing or wrath or stuff like that. Um, that's been changed to 16 now for Feral, which is what it was earlier in the beta cycle. I believe it's now 10 and 6. Uh, yes, but it's random, so it's not always 6. It's It varies between 4 and 8 uh, of Swift Spells, which is a bit of a big range, but that's what you get with disability, a big uh, variance. Yeah, what can you do? Yeah, um, it, it also almost always do between 3 and 5 bytes. That is fairly consistent, though. So that's worth keeping up. Yeah, which is what you want to it. So obviously, it can cast 16 spells. Um, there's a list of these spells that it can cast. So it can cast Rake. It can cast Ferocious Bite. It can cast Thresh. It can cast Shred. And it can cast Tiger's Fury. Those the uh, Feral specific abilities. And also Feral Frenzy uh, with a low percent chance. Yep. And then it can cast Wrath, Moonfire, which is now the Lunar Inspiration version of Moonfire when you're in cat form. Um, rejuvenation and regrowth as the um, non-form specific spells that you'll get regardless. Um, this is form specific so you can use it in Boomkin and you can use it in various different forms. Um, so you can use it with no form and you'll get the Resto Druid Convoke essentially. You can use it in bare form and you'll get the Guardian Druid Convoke. Um, like 20 billion Iron Furs. Yeah. <laughs> if you ever wanted a lot of Iron Furs then this is the one for you. I don't know why you want a lot of Iron Furs but maybe you do, who knows. Um, so this is pretty good in the running now. Um, it's largely focused on burst single target, though you can use it for burst AoE when combined with uh, various other talents and swapping into Boomkin form. Um, but we'll discuss that a bit more later. Um, so Venthyr is the next one to discuss. Uh, Venthyr hasn't changed a whole amount over the beta cycle. It's still a three minute cooldown, which gives you stacking bonuses as you use abilities. Um, why does it still have a downside? <laughs> My question for it. Uh, I, I don't know. But that's that seemed to be the um, fantasy for most Venture stuff is that they have random downsides that the other covenants don't have. I, I don't know. It's kind of weird. Yeah. I do think it's. I think there's only one other covenant ability in the game that has like a strict, like actual downside, which is uh, Venther. I think the Warlock one might have a downside. I'm sure THD mm. thinked to me about that at some point. Um, but yeah. Um, the, the, this downside whole... isn't big, it's worth saying. Like, it's a downside yeah. basically only if you, uh, for some reason, stop causing abilities or the boss go immune or whatever, otherwise it's... Yes. <laughs> and even then, you can maintain it with regrowth, yeah. or you can maintain it with uh, remove corruption, or kick, or a variety of spells. It's so bad it's not if you're lagging. Punishing. But it's bad if you're lagging, yeah. If you're lagging, this is probably not the covenant for you. Um, contact your ISP and ask them to refund your Renown farm. Um, what can you do? Um, right, so not a whole lot to talk about for Venthyr right now. Um, so Necrolord, again, hasn't really been changed over the course of the beta cycle. Um, you're a big Necrolord fan, Zan, so why don't you take this mm. one? Yeah, so Necrolord is a short cooldown ability, 25 seconds, that uh, is a dot on the target, and it uh, also increases the effectiveness of other dots on that target. Then when it expires, it then bounces to a friendly target and does the same thing but for heals, and then it bounces back again to a hostile target, and yeah, and that's how it goes. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of tricks to this, and the, the, this ability is deceptively simple it's actually quite it has a lot of random mechanics attached to it but the main thing is um it's a single target or t t two targets and it focuses on bleed damage essentially yeah so for those of you who like the old uh, spinny plates um this is 
probably something that you might want to eye up. Um, yeah. and of course, we'll probably to touch on it a bit more in a second, yeah. but yeah. And of course, the last one, which is the biggest mess of an ability, um, which is Kyrian. So Kyrian is... How to explain Kyrian. So Kyrian, you will bond to another target, um, and then when it has a one minute cooldown after that, and then when you use it, both you and your bonded partner will fill sort of pools of damage, and then any damage you deal will take damage out of this pool of damage and apply it. So it applies 20% of the damage to each ability, to each cast, um, and it's reasonably complicated in how it works. It's, yeah. it's relatively simple in practice when you play it, but the concept of how it works is a little bit messy. And um, don't ever put this on a tank or a healer because they will not get damage from it. They will in fact get healing or mitigation, whatever that means. I guess damage reduction probably. Yeah, so, you'll get so, some of their damage, uh, yep. which you don't really like. <laughs> yep, but the basic <laughs> premise of this is that you want to bind with someone who does similar damage as you or higher. And uh, that's the basic premise of the ability. And it's like a one minute, I think it's one minute cooldown. I guess one minute um, cooldown, 20 seconds. Yeah. And so of course, this lends itself very well to um, it's worth regular damage here. in TF. That there is a conduit that reduces the cooldown of that one minute. Um, don't ever equip that conduit. It's yeah, bad. it's probably a DPS loss <laughs> most cases. Just like, 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 actually, it's terrible. Don't, don't. It's never equip that conduit. Um, right. So we've gone through each of the conduits and how they've been changed. Um, so, what should you consider when you're picking a covenant? Because obviously, in one day, eight hours, twenty-two minutes, and twelve seconds now. Um, we're all going to be thrown in Shadowlands, and when we get to level 60, we're going to have to pick a Covenant. Um, and it's not the most binding choice, but it is reasonably binding. Yeah, it takes you a while to, um, especially if you commit time to farming the Renown with a certain Covenant, that basically is time wasted if you swap, so it's uh, yes. worth keeping so, in mind. So for those who don't know, when you swap Covenant, um, it will reset, your Renown is like your reputation with that Covenant. So it'll reset your reputation with the one you've now swapped to. So you'll have to start again from scratch. Yeah, you do keep it with the old one if you go back in the future, yeah. which is a process that also is annoying, by the way. So yeah, this is a choice. This is intended as something you do not just casually swap. Like it's a bit committal. So yeah. So while it's not a permanent choice, it is something that you you don't want to make the wrong choice to start with. So what would you consider when picking a covenant? So for the first part. For the most part, three of the Covenants are all extremely close on single targets. Um, Necrolord, um, Com Necrolord, Night Fae, and Kyrian are all very close on single target. A percent or so in between them. Yeah. On uh... AoE, it's a little bit closer, and Necrolord falls behind a bit more, with Kyrian and Night Fae um, and Vent there as well, pulling ahead. Um, but if you're going to be picking a Covenant for best performance, it's essentially going to be between Venthyr, Necrolord, not Venthyr, Necrolord, Kyrian, and Night Fae. Because yeah. each of those three has something where they excel in, where they're, where they're the best at it. And Venthyr kind of doesn't really have that. It's okay, and you can take it fine if you want to, no problem, it will perform okay, but there's nothing really where it's ever just the best option. And even um, like even at what Venture seems to be good at, which is burst, it's like a bit in the shadow of Night Fae because Night Fae is also a burst cooldown, and Night Fae's burst cooldown isn't as reliant on like your berserk cooldowns. Like that's more of a separate cooldown, you know, which is more useful. And also, it's a ninety seconds. Like if if so, even yeah, it's it's unfortunate, but Venture is probably something I would recommend not picking unless you really love the fantasy, in which case more power to you because whatever right enjoy the game but uh from a performance perspective i really think you should probably not pick venture with current balancing uh, yeah. at the start but for the other three you've got a reasonably general choice you can pick you can pick yeah. any of those really um kyrian is probably the best generally it's good on aoe it's good on single target it's a one minute cooldown um it's just generally fine it's not particularly interesting um as an ability in my opinion 
And it is a little bit hard to evaluate because it does depend on someone else. So yeah. when we sim these, we estimate that you're paired with somebody who does the same amount of damage as you. And we base it on that. But if something does go wrong with someone else or something goes wrong with you, there's now sort of two areas where something can go wrong and you can lose DPS from that. And it's also worth saying that, uh, like, for example, if the, the, for this to be useful in AOE, it is only up, you know, every, for a minute, like every minute. So it is a cooldown, even if it's a short cooldown, right? It's a small window. And so uh, it will be good, typically, because most cases, one minute is short enough that you can use it on most fights, or like most trash posts, for example, or something like this. But... Um, yeah, it, it is a bit of a messy code. Like if the bounded target die, for example, you have to cast to re-channel it onto someone else. That's pretty yeah. awkward. Like yeah. so, there, there are definitely risks with this ability, even if it looks really good on Sims. Like it's worth keeping in mind. It's yes. not perfectly. Yes. And it wow. does rely on having a friend, which is also worth saying. Like you can bond with yourself, but it is much weaker. It's significantly it's, uh, weaker. So yeah. the general the the. When you bond with somebody else, it's 20% damage to both you and the person you're bonded with. When you're bonded with yourself, it's just 15% damage, um, which anybody should be able to do that maths or work out. That is significantly weaker. Um, but it would work in Torghast for yourself, because obviously we did have questions about how would Kyrian work in Torghast. And the yeah, it's not useless good. when you're alone. It's just much yeah. less good. Um, so if you are focused on solo-only content for some reason, then Kyrian is probably not the covenant for you. Yeah, like World PvP or something, I guess? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so Necrolord. Um, obviously, Necrolord, as Zan mentioned, is the, the short cooldown dot. So this is a lot more focused towards sustained damage. And when it comes yep. to sustained damage, it's probably... It, it's definitely up there as one of the best options. Yeah, it's it's the most stable. It's more even more stable than Kyrian. Kyrian is pretty stable, but like this Necrolord is uh, extremely stable at doing damage. So it, because the the floor on it is pretty high if you're using on single target, because you will just basically have it up a certain percent of the time, and uh, your blood bleeds are basically always up, right? So it's very very consistent. Yeah. Um. It doesn't have a huge amount of AoE value, um, though it does have some two-target value. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it has some trickery with it as well that can make it very good on two targets, but it is a small scale AoE or like one mob type thing. Yeah. This is the thing, in an M+, plus, for example, you would put this on like a bigger target in a pack. Right? This yeah. is the type of thing that would boost a single target there. It's not going to help you burn down a big pack. Um, if you, it is worth mentioning, there is currently a bug, um, hopefully that bug will be fixed soon, where Lunar Inspiration does not gain increased damage from the Necrolord Adaptive Swarm. Um, I'm presuming that'll be fixed at some point, but... Uh, yeah, it seems now, like a very straightforward whitelist bug, that those type yeah. of things are pretty easy for Blizzard to fix, so it's yeah. pretty high chance that they will fix it. Um, but yes, if you like the spinning plates, if you like um, Jagged Wounds, and you like lead damage then Necrolord is a good option for, for that fantasy yeah and, um, and it's worth saying that like the spinny plate with like Necrolord setup isn't like like if you for example you're a type of feral that just likes playing that play style and yeah you care about performance but you know it's not the be all end all if you do 20 or 30 less dps which i'm literally talking about 20 30 dps by the way just throwing it out there the numbers are kind of small in Shetland. <laughs> um then you can actually play spinny plates with Necrolord, and it is very close to uh, viable choice. It might even end up being the best if um, a certain Lady Nair gets slightly nerfed. So it's worth saying that for single target, this is a pretty good choice. Like that type of build is, is pretty good. Like it's actually legitimately viable, I think. Yep. And of course, the last of the three that we want to talk about is Night Fae. Um, we talked about it a little bit before. Um, it's reasonably simple in terms of how you use it. Um, kind of like Kyrian, it's complicated to how it works and simple in how you use it. Um, you press every two minutes, you cast a load of spells, 
Um, the one thing that it is worth talking about is the fact that you can use it in different forms. So for big AOE pulls, you can go into Boomkin form um, with Heart of the Wild or without Heart of the Wild, and you can use Convoke and you'll get Starfall, potentially Full Moon, Star Surges. On a big AOE packs, that can be better than using it in cat form, because obviously Starfall is such a strong spell. Uh, uncapped AOE is reasonably good. Yeah. And if you do that, you can also, when you are in um, balance form, especially out of the wild, you can also Sunfire basically for free before you come up, yes. and that's also decent damage. It's it's very, um, like the Heart of the Wild plus Convoke is the strongest AoE burst you can get as well. That's just unfortunately the situation. Um, I mean, Heart of the Wild is a long cooldown. It's between, minutes, yeah. yeah, it's between four and five minutes depending on conduit choices. But it is, um, it, it is pretty strong. Uh, it is definitely stronger than Venture at that, for example, yeah. which is why Venture doesn't really have a place. But as far as when you when you pick this and when it excels, this sort of really excels when you've got burst moments on bosses. Um, so like Sludge Fist, for example, has a period where he takes 100% increased damage. So Convoke fits into that really nicely. You can just press Convoke, have a huge Convoke, and then go on from there. I do think this and, is one uh... of the better options because of that, because of how focused modern raiding is on burst. Yeah, and a 90 second cooldown, um, like this is the, like, you know, the 90 to 120 second cooldown range is something fell yeah. as traditionally lacked, which is nice. Like, yes. it's very nice to have a cooldown this range, because that's typically when you need it in boss fights. Like, two minute cooldowns are traditionally not just a little bit better than three minutes, they're typically a lot better than three minutes, just because of they line up, end up lining up way better than uh, three minutes yeah. do. Because most frequently fights, it's always multiples of a minute, basically. Pretty much always when there's a burst moment. So stuff like, uh, that springs to mind recently is like Kingaroth, where it was two minutes exactly. And it was a mess between what CDs do you hold, what CDs do you use where, whereas this just sort of fits into that. Um, Avatar of Sargeras, the same deal, where there was a shield you had to burst down, that was multiples of a minute. And it was a mess of yeah. where you hold it. Um, so yes, this does fill a nice niche where suddenly we've got a two-minute burst cooldown that we can fit into those windows. Um, so we're going into Shadowlands, so I'm sure you've already thought about what Covenant you're picking, Zan, because I know I have. Um, yeah. Has that choice changed since we first talked about what we'd pick? Mm, it kind of has, yes, for me. Um, like, so I'm... I'm... I'm going to be realistic and say that there's like a 60% chance that I'm just picking Night Fae anyway. But like I said before, last time I said I would pick Night Fae like 100% of the time. Uh, but I am very, very tempted to go Necrolord just because for me, I, I like the spinny playstyle build and I also like single target focus of it and the consistency. I'm very anti Kyrian because um, I, I don't yeah. like that type of thing. Personally, I don't think I would enjoy having that ability very much. Like, if it would be overpowered, I would play it, obviously, but yeah. Um, so that's where I'm at. I'm between Necro and, and Night Fae. I'm not super sure, but I, I'd probably end up Night Fae like everyone else, because the fantasy is so good, and the fact that it feels a niche, etc. it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, so I think I'm pretty stuck on Night Fae. Um, I was leaning towards Kyrian when Night Fae was at 12. I was kind of torn between Night Fae and Kyrian. With Night Fae at 16, I think that the way it performs is enough for me to sort of definitely go Night Fae. Um, yeah. The, the thing is, I, I, I do think, so it, it, from a balancing perspective, if you're like trying to meta game a Blizzard balancing, um, <laughs> which which I'm, I'm not gonna like endorse or whatever, uh, or condemn that, but if you're trying to meta game the balancing, I think Night Fae and Kyrian are very like so night fey i'm not sure because it's so hard to evaluate how strong uh, the reason for that is because the the ability what it says it randomly casts abilities but it doesn't cast abilities randomly so it uses a bunch of rules and distributions and stuff uh which is why the this ability is a complete mess to actually understand um but why it took a while to get implemented in Simcraft, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's probably also there. the most inaccurate aspect of, of um, simulation still and theory crafting because it's really, really annoying to um, determine how it works exactly because there's no information on it, right? But uh, 
like this is the most likely to be hilariously overpowered uh, of all the Covenant abilities. The others are fairly easy to evaluate comparatively. So that's worth keeping in mind. I also think Kyrian might just end up being nerfed. Because, uh, Kyrian has gotten a lot of attention recently with like uh, the conduit nerfs uh, or yeah. by nerfs rather and stuff. Uh, so I, I, I would say Night Fae is probably going to be the best choice, I think, overall. But it is also the one that's most likely to get nerfed Heroic Week randomly in my approximation. So that's worth keeping in mind, I guess, if you are a gambler. Yeah, you can, you can never rely on... Oh, well, you can always rely on Blizzard just randomly destroying something in Heroic Week. <laughs> yep. And I think Necrolord is probably the safest choice in that sense, because it's going to be more yes. um, low-key. I think Necrolord will probably fly under the radar. Um, yeah. Are there any particularly interesting Soulbinds we want to talk about? <sighs> Soulbind? Well, I mean, we can talk about Pod Tender, are... which is obviously the, yep. the Night Fae Soulbind. So it's in the second tree of Night Fae, and what Pod Tender does is a 10-minute cooldown, and it's essentially a cheat death. It's not as good as cheat death, but it is a pseudo cheat death, um, which is quite nice for progress. Um, yeah. So that does the, exist. Yeah, Dreamweaver, uh, which is the soulbind that has that potender, is is uh, a very good progress choice because it, it's also a lower renown to unlock the potency. Yes. Um, which is worth keeping in mind. This is, by the way, another thing worth saying about Venture. Why, why I actually don't like Venture is because they also, by far, the worst so bind renowns setup. It's so, like twenty-eight for two potent yeah. some of their trees, which is insane. Which means it will take you forever, like many weeks, into mythic progress before you actually unlock the power of it's these like trees. Like week eight or week eight or something. It's insane. Yeah. So for those who don't know, um, when mythic comes out, you'll be exp you'll be around um, fifteen potency. 15 renowns, sorry. Um, so you start off at one, you get three per week, and then you get um, two for random chapters. One for chapter one, and then one for chapter five, I think it is. Um, and then after that, you'll get around three per week. So Mythic Week, you'll get you'll, you'll be around 15. So Dreamweaver, which is the pod tender soulbind tree, gets two potencies at um, renown 13. And then I think most others get it around 21. Which instead of being, if Mythic Week is week uh, week four, then I think most others get it around week six, and then Venter gets it to its twenty eight, which is like week eight, week nine. Yeah. So it's a it's it's not just a little leap; it's a significant change. Um, and obviously, potency conduits are, are actually quite strong for Feral. They're around three to four percent at the high end. Yep. So, which is pretty crazy. But which, there you go. which is, which isn't bad. Um, it's on the higher end of the value of potency conduits. Um, I did have a chat with Word Up at some point, and some of his potency conduits are literally like twenty DPS, um, which is a little bit sad. We have uh, we have a few of those as well, actually. But yeah, yes. we definitely have good choices at least, which is yes. nice. And I think the good choices that we have are actually quite interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they actually, they are, they are big enough that they're somewhat noticeable, which is nice. Yes. And they're not just like super passive boing. They haven't actually changed much since the last time we've talked about conduits. So no, but I guess I guess much. I can just quickly say that the three you care about. Oh, okay, so if you're playing Night Fae, you care about the Night Fae exclusive conduit. If you're playing Necrolord, you care about the Necrolord exclusive conduit. Those are called Evolved Swarm and Conflux of Elements, respectively. Yep. If you're playing Kyrian, you hate the conduit specific one. And well, if you're playing Venture, I guess it's basically mandatory as well. But you should. Venture is bad, right? Keep that in mind. Venture is not very good at this. Um, then, other than that, there's three good conduits. And those are Carnivore's Instinct, which increases TF's uh, damage bonus. Sudden Ambush, which gives you a chance to gain uh, basically stealth for an ability um, when you use a finisher. And Taste for Blood, which increases ferocious by damage based on the number of bleeds on the target. Those are the three good ones uh, in most cases. With basically and, uh, Carnivorous Instinct being relevant in AoE and the other two being primarily more relevant in single target. Yeah, but even on single target, Carnivorous Instinct is fine. So yeah. it's, it's worth saying bad, that... Yes. The, 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 there's one who's really bad, which is Incessant Hunter, which gives energy back when Rip ticks or has a chance to rather. That that's terrible, but don't don't use that ever, basically, in current tuning. And so that's that's a TLDR of of uh, 
potency conduits for Pharaoh. <laughs> we have okay. three good ones. Depending on your con uh, convenant, you have a fourth good one that is basically mandatory. Um, and that's basically it. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Um, you'll get them for various contents. Slot them in. There's on. very strong uh, utility one, ut ones as well, which um, that might sound weird, but there's utility slots. And we have really strong defensive ones, actually. Yes, uh, we actually do. We, we can talk about those. So yeah. I think the, the two main... So there's the Barksian cooldown reduction, which 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 might be pretty nice depending on the content if you particularly want more bark skins um maybe you want bark skin to line up with a particular mechanic in which case that might be really strong there's ursine vigor so ursine vigor is essentially last stand so when you shift into bear form it will give you uh, a percent more health and armor um a decent amount of percent i think it's about 20 percent at rank seven which yeah. is pretty strong it's a extremely low cooldown defensive essentially um it's great and the last is frenzied regeneration which when you drop below 40 percent health it will automatically cast a frenzied regeneration um in any form um it won't take you out of the form it will proc while you're cc'd uh it will proc whenever um which is all of those are situationally potentially strong and generally quite strong there's also one which increases regrowth and frenzy region healing, which is bad, yeah. but it's also okay, like it's not terrible. And then there's one which uh, does something with Iron Fur, and that one is obviously yeah, useless. That one's so. just bad, and you don't use yeah. it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've we've got quite good po conduit choices in general, I think. Um, there's stuff that's not just strong, but also interesting. Um, and we actually have a decent amount of choice, especially in comparison to some of the other classes that I've looked at. Which is nice. Um, so the next of the Shadowland systems that people are obviously concerned about are legendaries. Um, yeah. So legendaries, you'll do content in the Moor and in Torghast, and you'll earn Soul Ash, which is the, the currency that you use to craft legendaries. Um, crafters like leather workers, blacksmiths, uh, tailors will have to then make base recipes. For the legendaries and you'll purchase one of those on the auction house or be given one by your guild and you'll then um, take it to the the rune carver who's the magical legendary man up at the top of Torghast and he will craft you a legendary with stats of your choice um, in the slot of your choice within limits depending on the legendary and with the legendary effect that you want all of those legendary effects they have a set place they drop um, and you can just go from there and craft your legendaries. It's worth saying that the amount of soul ash you can gain is gated. So yes. there is a limit. Um, it's a little bit complicated. It depends on which week it is, how much you can earn and stuff. But it doesn't matter. The, the point is there's a limit to how much you can get. So it's been changed a few times as well. Yeah, I don't have the numbers in my head, but it, the, the TLDR on this is that it takes a while for you to be able to craft high and legendaries. So it it it's not a permanent choice. You will be able to craft everything eventually, but yep. it is a semi-important choice. Yeah. So uh, if I remember correctly, the numbers were something like you'd be able to get a rank two by Mythic Week or something, or you'd be able to have. Mm, I think you can get even a rank ones. three at Mythic Week. So I think the options are. I think you can have two ones by Heroic Week or one two, and then I think you can have one three by Mythic Week or like one or one two and one one or something like that. It's close to those numbers at least. Yeah, that sounds very reasonable. So there's there's really two main legendaries that Feral cares about in, in the general sense. I would say there's three, but yeah, let's go. Okay, ahead. fine. Um, so there's Katai Curio, which is just generally the best option. Um, it's the strongest in single target, it's competitive, and when I say the strongest, it's like 14%, which is a big number. For oh, legendaries. no legendary, yeah. yeah. It, it's extremely high. I'm not sure if it is the strongest legendary in the game, but it is probably one of the strongest in the game. Yeah. Um, and that is obviously, it increases your energy pool by 60, and 25% of your uh, clear casting spells get refunded. Great, more energy. It's it's reasonably standard at this point, and that drops in from a boss in one of the dungeons. Uh, and I know a lot of people. No, oh, sorry. 
I know a lot of people have immediately said, okay, but Mock increases the rate of Omen proc, so surely this interacts very well with this uh, legendary. The short answer to that is it does, but it doesn't interact well enough to actually push Mock ahead of other options in vast majority of cases. So this isn't like, oh, I have this legendary, I go Mock every time. That, that's not how that works. Like Mock might be a fine choice, but it is not uh, well, the slam dunk choice. It's yeah, it, this synergy isn't strong advanced. enough at all. Um, so that's the first of the legendaries. Um, the second of the legendaries I'd consider, and then Zan can tell me the third that he'd consider, is uh, Circle of Life and Death, which does drop from a raid boss, but it's the uh, the Jagged Wounds legendary that you might have heard about that reduces dot durations and tick speed by 25%. Um, it's strong in Mythic Plus. It's not awful in single target. I think it's third or so for most of the Covenants, so it's competitive. Um, but it is clearly the best in Mythic Plus content. Um, yeah, it is clearly the best uh, in Mythic Plus, that's certainly true. And for AoE in, in general, and the, um, the reason is because of how, at, at like more than three or four targets, uh, depending on other turns, Prime of Wrath just becomes the best spammable ability uh, of finishers. So what happens then if you have Circle of Life and Death is just that, so that means you will have rip up on every target. But if you have Circle of Life and Death, that means you basically get more ticks in between each cast. So you waste yep. less ticks essentially because so that is why primarily it's just the best AV you know. And that basically doesn't depend on Covenant or anything. It's just basically how it is. Yeah. Um right. so what's your third then? So the third one is actually drought of something. Okay, that's reasonable. Deep focus drought. Drought to deep focus. Yeah. yeah. Drought to deep focus. So the thing with this one is it clearly has an obvious weakness, which is it doesn't do much on AoE. But it um it is very close to Katakuri actually in tuning. So in and especially in like Necrolord setups, but not exclusively, it is very close and sometimes it's actually even better than Katakuri. Um I wouldn't necessarily recommend crafting it first because it is obviously more situational than the other two. But it is uh it's very strong and it's worth keep in mind it can actually be very strong. And especially that's, later on when you get more legendaries, it can actually be the best awesome. one in a single target. Yeah, sure. I, I can I can agree with that. Um, so one question that we did have a lot of is crafting order and how do you craft these? So yeah. as much as you're going to want to get into Shadowlands and you're going to have all these new tools and you're going to play with the new shiny things, I would strongly recommend that you do not craft a legendary until at earliest Heroic Week. If you can get away with it and if your guild will allow you, Mythic Week probably. The reason for this is there's almost certainly going to be tuning. And we don't know how, how heavy-handed Blizzard are going to be or what they're going to target. So the safest option is just to not take the risk, basically. And this is especially important when you consider how powerful Katakurio and indeed uh, Droth is. Because both of them are over 10% increase in damage. Um, compared to no legendary, which is extreme high end of legendaries in the yes. game for our classes. So I, I just want to point out that while they may not decide to care too much about these legendaries, because Feral itself is not probably not tuned to be among the highest, like overpowered tier by any means, which I'm going to be completely honest with. Um, depending on how much they care about inter-legendary balance, they might nerf these very hard, very quickly. It's worth keeping that in mind. So so that's why it's super important to save as long as you can. Yeah. But if nothing has changed by Heroic Week, uh, they give you a very, you know, 10 to 14% is a very substantial increase in throughput. So I personally would probably craft Heroic Week. And I know some people say you save for Mythic, but I would probably personally actually just yes. craft tier one that's, uh, in Heroic Week. Yes, if that's it a very guild-dependent thing. If you can get away with it, yeah. then saving Mythic Week is the safest. But if you do need yes. it for Heroic Week progression or for splits, or because your guild officers want you to make it, then that's fine. You're, you're probably going to be okay. It'll definitely be good for the Heroic Week. It'll do its job. And I would be surprised if they nerfed it enough that it was... Bad. Yeah, it's unlikely to be bad. I agree with that. Like yes. at the low end for that is not very terrible. And even if that happens, you still, if you only craft it to rank one, um, and you haven't lost too much soul ash. Yeah, you haven't lost much ash. You don't put yourself very far behind. You will yeah. catch up again in like week three or something. So it's like week 
three totals a week two mythic, which is not not bad. So obviously you can craft these on various different slots. So each of the legendaries has two slots you can craft it on. Um, so for Katai Curio, for example, you can craft it on the finger slot or the neck slot. So what you need to consider when you craft your legendary is which of these slots, because they're high eye level items at the end of the day, they're not just the legendary effect, they are also higher high level items. So what you need to consider is what slot to put it on. So for Katai Curio, which only goes on finger and neck, both of those slots have the exact same item budget. So really you can craft either of those. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Craft it in the slot where you have the lowest eye level, go from there. And for um, draft, you want to craft neck? Um, uh, isn't draft chest and neck? So you'd want to craft uh, chest? I guess it depends on what... So it... Okay, okay. It's a bit more complicated. It depends how far in the future you look. So the reason it sure. matters is because the higher end mythic raid bosses, the later mythic raid bosses drop higher eye level loot, which includes for us, I'm pretty sure, both chest and head. Okay, that's reasonable. So for Biss, if you're talking about Biss in like say week five or something mythic uh, or whatever off the farm basically, or last boss maybe, um, it is better to craft legendary on neck and ring. But if you kept an early progression because of the, the big boost in stats, then yes, it's better to craft Chester head. That's basically go. where it's at. Yeah, which also applies for the Jagged Wounds legendary Circle of Life or Death, which is head or finger. Yeah. yeah um, fair enough, yeah. So obviously you've got a decision to make there. <laughs> I mean, it, it's basically between farm, farm and, and progress, yes. right? Progress definitely yes. better craft the, the um, armor piece. Yes, for the higher budget. But right, of course, so you've got the Katakurio, which if nothing changes, is probably what most people do, then yeah. it doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah, matter. because it will be on finger or neck regardless. And right. arguably, I guess finger is probably better because it's just lots, just throwing it out there. If, if it, the option is between fingers and neck, and you don't have like insane rings, like yep. it's probably better to go finger. Safer. Um, right. So the last, or not the last thing, but I guess we move on to talents now, because obviously feral talents um, that we're running in pre-patch are very different to what people would have expected. And there's a variety of things to talk about in terms of how covenants impact talents. We've touched on moment of clarity and heart of the wild a little bit. Of course, do we have any talents that are just dead, that aren't usable? Uh, scent of Blood is the most obvious one, and we're going to keep harping on about Scent of Blood. But <laughs> Scent of Blood is completely useless, don't ever take, never good at anything, really. Yep. It is a DPS increase in AoE, I guess, technically, but basically not barely even that, so yeah. Um... Yes, I have my notes. Scent of, don't take this talent. So yep. that, that's basically it. So, uh, and Scent I, of Blood I, is the yeah. obvious one that we've talked about loads. Yep. Um, so we can harp on about that a little bit more. But do we have any other yep. talents that are that are dead? Oh, so I know you and I have talked incarnation. Yeah, incarnation is very weak. It's I cannot imagine. Similar to Venter, I cannot really imagine a case where this type of like extremely specific three minute burst increase of like a very small range would justify this which is the niche where it would be justified right yep. because it just buffs your cooldown uh so removing that um and also by the way it's worse than that so the only thing incarnation does it increases the duration of berserk for 10 seconds that's pretty good and then it gives you 20 percent energy cost reduction during it which um and it allows you to prowl prowl doesn't do anything for damage it has rare utility um, in PP, it allows you to stun, for example. But that's ex extreme, extreme niche thing. Um, but um, yeah, so so it gives you a little bit uh, more abilities cost in Berserk, both by duration and the energy cost. The thing with this is, okay, you may get you get slightly more DPS in the cooldown, but and there's a big but. It, this is much weaker with heroism, first of all. So if you, or um, Bloodlust, if you um, uh, have a specific thing, which is like, I need to burst this boss really hard, like uh, with a three minute cooldown, and you have Bloodlust, then this basically adds very little value as well. So that's, <laughs> that makes it's it worse. It's very likely that if, if, yeah. if it's a three minute burst, you're probably going to 
to Save list it. for it. Yeah. yeah. So so this is just not very. It, it just doesn't have a niche, and it's not very powerful. So the combination is is very bad, unfortunately. Right. So what about some other talents that people might might think are dead or see as dead, like say Savage Raw? Yeah. So Savage Raw is actually a pretty good talent. So it's it's behind Solar to Forest. Most cases single target, with the notable exception being a spinny plate build with Necrolord, where it is the best choice. Uh, but it is probably this, the best talent that isn't the premier choice in most cases. Like, it's very close. So first, it's within a few percent, basically every situation. So, that, like, Savage is not a weak talent by any means. Yeah. Um, and I think on AoE and, like, in M-plus stuff, it can actually probably be very viable as well. Because you get to preserve it between pulls and stuff, which makes yeah. it a bit better. But obviously, um, this is something that people are probably familiar with on live at the moment, because Savage Raw particularly at the end of this expansion has been very competitive in mythic plus sort of something that we realized yeah. at the end with corruption um and obviously it's been buffed over the beta cycle which kind of accounts for the loss of stats so potentially this could be an option later on into the expansion yeah and they like i said it might already be if you're going necrolord uh, so yeah. so especially necrolord or if with rot and uh, lunar inspiration which, th th that's a very strong combo. So that is actually a very viable combo in some cases. But, so yeah, Savage Row is not that bad, actually. And people harp on Savage Row being bad way unfairly. Like, sure, you can argue you think it should be better than Solo to Forest, which is very passive. Sure, that's an argument, but it's not that bad, honestly, compared to other tons. And of course, uh... the, the other talent that kind of lives in this niche of um, being viewed as bad is Moment of Clarity. Um... Which again we've talked about a little bit before. It does synergize really well with Kata Curio, but not really by enough to move it into the best option. Yeah, most of the time it's just gonna be the third best in that row, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh it used to have a bit of a niche with um AOE and swipe, but now with swipe being target capped, even that niche is very uh, significantly reduced. Yeah. So while it's not it's, really dead, it's, it's just fine, not really good. I guess, but it's not no, exactly. It's it's never the best. I, I yeah. honestly don't think like people say, Oh, but as a noob choice, sure, but just go fell frenzy, it's not that hard to use, come on. It's a forty five second cooldown, like Blood Talons and Feral Frenzy are the other talents on that row. Um it's worth mentioning that Feral Frenzy is currently bugged in a variety of ways. Yeah. So it randomly ignores I think it was eight percent of mastery, which is base mastery. Um not quite sure why it does that. It also snapshots snap stats, which we've known about for a while. Um, so it'll snapshot mastery, it'll snapshot versatility. Um, again, it, not quite sure why it does that. But it the, also doesn't matter that much. That that one doesn't matter. It also that doesn't one. matter that much. That, that's not really a negative bug. It's more no. likely to be a positive bug. Um, but the last thing that is rather negative, along with the sort of discounting eight percent mastery, is that. It ignores weapon DPS on the damage over time portion, which yep. is a big downside. So this is and accounted this, for in this, Sims. Yeah. Um, and this nets to like 20% or so less damage than it should deal, basically, yep. based on the tooltip. So it's worth saying that um, with these bugs fixed, this becomes a very, very competitive with Blood Talents. And in some cases... I'd say it's like maybe 50-50, depending on legendaries and, you know, exact yeah. gear and stuff, which is better on most cases. So very, very good talent, very competitive. Uh, with the bug fix, might even be the best one in that row. But it's certainly not that far away from BT. So, yeah. yeah. And even even with those bugs unfixed, it's not an awful talent. It's, no, it's um, not. And and it... sims are right, like you said. Yes. So. I, I can easily see it being a good option in a fight dependent scenario. Yeah. Um right, so uh... Blood Talons. Blood Talons has been um been for a few reworks this beta cycle and it's now as Blood Talon apparently must always be controversial. Um what how do you feel about Blood Talons? Uh so yeah. I'm okay with this current version of Blood Talons. It is not as interesting as the first rework was to me because yep, it's no, this that. is very forgiving. It doesn't have much for process to it. But it is at the same time, I don't think this is like 
much worse than old blood talents like people are whining about all the time like i i really like old blood turns to me was not very interesting because you're just costing a heal and that's all there's to it then you do that every time before it could finish and basically you macro it into your there was points muscles. where it was interesting but it, that's oh, yeah, a long sure. time ago now yeah yeah, yeah. it hasn't been interesting for a while particularly interesting talent yeah ironically it would probably have been a lot more interesting in this this uh version of pharaoh with much less resources but alas it's no longer around <laughs> So unfortunate. <laughs> like I think so the blood talents now is too forgiving and that's part of the problem with it. But it is still not not completely forgiving. You you do need to yeah. pull a little bit more and you need to think about it a little bit. It's just not it is it is a play around, but it's not that much of a play around. So um yes. So there's been a lot of talk about blood talents and berserk and how they supposedly have negative synergy. Um while there's some truth in that, it's not really something that I really agree with, because I do feel that it's reasonably trivial to prop Blood Talons during Berserk, especially with how forgiving it is now, and you can fit yeah. it around finishers, so you can have a finisher in between your two different generators. Um, yeah, I mean, it only means that in practice, uh, it means that you have to weave in a Brutal Slash in your thing, or a Refresh yes. and Moonfire if you have a lie. Like, it's not that much of a hassle, honestly. And yeah, it's slightly negative synergy, sure, because Shred would be a better cast, whatever, in Berserk. But you can alternate Rake at and the Brash, same time, which you want to cast anyway, because you're yeah, to exactly. the blood. And, and it's worth saying that, yes, that is a nerf, but at the same time, you're casting more bites than you would normally, which... Yes. Is buffed by blood talents. Like it's it's not that straightforward to say it's bad with berserk. It's not really. It's kind of neutral with it. So yeah. Right. So we we talked about the feral frenzy bug. There's one other reasonably significant talent bug, um, which is lunar inspiration with necrolord. Yeah. We mentioned that when we talked about the covenant. It yep. just uh, worth repeating that the actual moonfire. The ally version of Moonfire doesn't work with that. Um, it's not increased. And I actually think that's also true for Drought. Um, I think that's true. So, like, basically, this is a bunch of whitelist bugs. They have whitelisted Moonfire, but not the Lunar Inspiration version of Moonfire, which is technically a different spell. This is all a technical coding thing, but yeah. These are probably very trivial bugs for Blizzard to fix. So these are pretty likely to be fixed. The Fair Frenzy bug, for example, is much less trivial probably to fix. So it's a bit of a mess. I, I would say that the Draught LI and the um, uh, AS LI bugs are very likely to be fixed. Um, but they exist. Worth keeping in mind. Yep. Um, and then uh, I, guess, I guess we should also touch on that first row because. Yep. A lot of people are just assuming Sabretooth is like find away the best talent. Sabretooth is not find away the best talent. It is good. It is probably best in many cases. It has been changed from the uh, BFA version of it, so it's no longer well. Yeah, the pre-patch obviously, but yep. it is uh, only five second increase, which means rip actually do expire, especially with lower gear. Yep. So I think last time um, we looked, you got around 60 seconds of extra rip duration, which is a long a long amount of extra rip duration, but it's not enough that you can just pretend rip doesn't exist, at least. Yep. And so Eli is actually kind of okay. It's, like I said, with Savage Roar and Dot Base builds, actually better. It is also pretty good on AoE, because you can actually multi-dot with it, something Sabertooth does pretty badly, because when you're primal roughing, so on, on like two or three targets, sure, Primal Rough and Sabertooth works okay together, but the moment you get like four plus and you just start Primal Roughing AoE, then Eli is actually a decent multi-dot option, whereas, because it's a cheap spell that you know combo points, right? Whereas uh, Sabertooth just goes to zero in value. So Eli is actually pretty decent and plus choice. Um, and similarly... Obviously competing with Predator, which is yeah, very yeah. strong and plus choice. Predator is is also a bit odd. Like Predator is good still. It's going to be probably the best in plus in many cases, but it isn't as straightforward of a winner as it has been, because uh, a lot of that energy goes into shreds or swipes yep. rather, sorry, and Which swipes are worse pretty inefficient. Yep. So worth keeping in mind. Like all of these talents are probably likely to be decent and are sometimes going to be best. That's just how it works. And I think actually. It is pretty likely that Eli might be like a sustain cleave type choice again, which is the niche it used to have ages yep, ago. Sure, on two or three times. So, yeah, like council. Long time fights. Yep. 
Yeah. So, worth keeping in mind, not terrible. Pretty good, actually. So, how do we feel about covenants impacting talents? Are there any covenants which particularly favour certain talents? Obviously, we've mentioned uh, the Spinny Plates build with yeah. Necrolord. Um... Necrolord, Savage Drawer, Lunar Inspiration, and then either Full Frenzy Blood Talents. Yep. That's that's the most obvious one. Uh, there is with Night a slight Fae. favor of Kyrian towards Sabretooth. Yeah. So Kyrian, the reason is Kyrian likes, because it's every one minute, 10 seconds every minute where you build a pool, that synergizes really well with like TF and putting a lot of bites into TF in that specific window. Yep. So it is Possibly. a little bit play around, I guess, up to most of pool just before, etc. Yep. That is, that is, so that synergizes is a little bit better with that. And then... Night Fae and um, Venture are pretty much neutral on, on the other talents. Like, there are some theoretical benefits, like, for example, because you get a bunch of bites, Sabretooth is okay with with um, Night Fae, but at the same time, it, it it actually doesn't mean that much in practice on single targets, so the difference is very marginal. I don't think... I think what is worth keeping in mind with talents is that if you're going Night Fae Covenant, um, Heart of the Wild and Balance Affinity becomes yeah. very high value. So yeah, basically they, they, they get locked. Options. Yeah, they get semi-locked in most cases, um, which can be good and can be a bit unfortunate if, for example, you need Mass Entanglement or Mighty Ash, but it's worth keeping in mind. Yep. Um, it is worth noting, I think, that Lunar Inspiration is not great with Night Fae because you don't gain anything during Convoke. Because obviously you get Lunar Inspiration, Moonfire regardless in Convoke. Yeah, yeah you do, but it, it ends up being not very significant difference okay. anyway. Fair like it, like it, it's true, it does, that is an accurate uh, synergy, but it is pretty minor, so like in practice it I don't doesn't think really it's impact the... No. Yeah. Cool. Right, so um, the last sort of set of things we have to talk about in talents um, is we had somebody ask about leveling talents. I think leveling talents are probably a no-brainer predator feral frenzy. Yeah, I, pretty much. Yeah, like predator, Premier Ruff, feral frenzy. Predator slash depends Primal on Ruff. what kind of pose you can do, and solid voice of are both fine, honestly. Like do whatever. Maybe yep. like like you could go a light to range pull, but you can also just you know cat form out swap out of cat form and moonfire. Like it doesn't matter. Or go balance if you care. Form and cast Moonfire as well. Yeah, it pretty much is. Cost. Yeah, um, pretty much is. So there's no talents that are hugely impactful when leveling. Um, maybe take Rest of Affinity so you have some healing, um, and you have Ursul's Vortex to gather mobs. But there's nothing that yeah. will make or break your leveling. Just have fun with it, enjoy it, sleep, don't sleep. Either way. So right. We've gone through all of the new Shadowlands content. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about? Or do we want to get into some questions? Of which we had a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. I don't think... I guess I'll just summarize some random stuff Fire that away. people are talking about. So, for example, there's a lot about whining about, oh, Feral is useless or whatever and compared to other classes and it's just constant annoyance of hearing people talking about sims as some kind of authoritative way to compare classes because it is not different specs and different classes make different assumptions about a lot of stuff which means the dps number is not really like you should always consider the dps number a sim generates compared to the same spec uh, that's the only number which is uh, intended to be super accurate and um that's why, for example, Dungeon Slice can be... Some some Fury Craft is considered really bad. It is not that bad for Feral, because I intentionally set up the sim so that it isn't terrible for Feral. And it, it gives you a good result that actually compares a reasonably average scenario for gear, which is what I care about. So, like, yes. if Dungeon Slice tells you that, for example, a talent is, like, a lot better or a legendary is a lot better, that is pretty realistic. That's the point of how that is set up. That doesn't mean that this number will perfectly compare with how it would look in a real M+. Because, so, for example, if, I, if say, a mage, I don't know, but, like, say, a fire mage seem really badly in Dungeon Slice but do really well in M+, that might mean that it is bad for them. That doesn't mean it's bad for us because they're set up differently. 
and stuff like this actually do annoy me. Like you should be very scared, very careful with like stack rankings in sim between different specs because yeah, the assumptions are very different in some cases. Um worth actually talking about dungeon slice. So dungeon slice, obviously a lot of people complain that it is it is not exact to a mythic plus. But for the most part, when we're simming for raids, we're simming patchwork which yeah. isn't exact for most raid bosses either. So much like you could go through and you could build a exact raid boss in SimCraft, you could also go through and build an exact M plus in SimCraft if you really wanted to. But for the most part, the purpose of Dungeon Slice is to be representative. So it's not supposed to show your exact pulls and how much DPS you can do over the dungeon, but it's supposed to mix single target, mix AOE of varying different pack sizes, and it's supposed to give you a representative answer. So it's not going to be exact, but it's going to be indicative of what's best. Yeah. Much like and patchwork for, example, for raiding. And for example, people complain about a oh, certain percent single target is unrealistic and stuff. But the thing is, what you need to keep in mind is that the single target percent also weights gear a certain way. And in M+, plus, even on a pack where there's like three mobs, single target actually has higher value than other sources of damage. And this is especially true when you are have a lot of bursty, AOE bursty classes in, in a pack, for example. AOE becomes, like your actual DPS AOE becomes less weighted, right? So sure, the, the, if Daniel Slice isn't perfect or anything, that's not my point, but you, yeah, it's not that bad. It really is not that bad for comparing gear or talents and stuff like this, which is what it's intended to do. For Pharaoh specifically, anyway, that is, that is an accurate statement. So, yeah. Um, cool. I mean, this is also true for Patrick, by the way. Like, for example, range yes. DPS spec seeming higher is super normal because they often assume that there's zero movement in a sim, which, and stuff like this, right? And movement at yes. uneven times and stuff like this. It is this. Don't, don't compare. It's pretty useless. Compare on logs if you have to compare. That's more realistic. That's and the only way, in my opinion, to compare. And we'll see that in Heroic Week. Yeah. Right. So we had a fuck ton of questions. We had 61 questions I have on my sheet now, which is a lot. Um, I don't think we've ever had even close to that number of questions. So very clearly, we haven't been able to get to all of those questions. So I've gone through, I've picked out some of the questions that either amused me or were interesting questions that I thought we could approach. Some of those have been included in the topics we've already discussed, and then some of those are now. So the first question, this is going to be a controversial one, is um, a square layout combo points versus line laid out combo points. Van is obviously, Van claims he is the inventor of square combo points, so he has a clear, a clear bias here. <laughs> Yeah, well, square combo points are more <laughs> space efficient. That's pretty unarguable. Um, yes. So, I mean, it's it's fun. Do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> I mean, I've seen I've seen one guy in Feral who has pictures of cats as his combo points. Do that if you want. Or oh, pause, yeah, matter. pause, pretty common. Pause, yeah. I think I've, I've been um, I've been experimenting with circular combo points. That's circular uh, combo points. So you know, there are many options. <laughs> Yeah, pick pick whatever you want to do. Um, if you pick square, you're wrong. But apart from that, you it's do more you space guys. efficient. <laughs> it's more space efficient. <laughs> um, doesn't fit into my layout. Um, right. So that's obviously not a particularly serious question. Um, but there are some that are a bit more. So this one is a bit more serious. So it's. A ferocious bite being the core of the rotation versus rip. How do you feel about the two things? I personally yeah. have rather mixed thoughts on this. Yeah. I'm not even sure if... Hmm. I'm not sure if the premise of this is actually how I perceive things to be, but so basically what I see this as is uh, a consequence of two things that people complain about. So one of them is a lot of people complained when we were very heavily bleed based was that we had very low burst, um, like short term burst and swap burst. So like, for example, if you swapped a different target and you just couldn't do much to it, it did take you 10 seconds or something minimum to even do okay damage on it. Um, and the second is that a lot of damage was shifted into finishers versus builders in general. Um, and when it's shifted into finishers, then you have to pick whether you want it to be like early legion, where rip is like 90% of the finisher damage, and it's like total, you know, 50% of the damage breakdown or something. Like Not quite that bad, but you know my point, it was very high. Or if um, you want it to be DD, then it has to be bite that does the damage. 
So I think there's an argument that finishes overall is a little bit too uh, overpowering compared to builders because I don't think the rest of our kit really is set up to support. I think uh, like we don't have yeah. Shadow Dance or whatever, which is very heavy finisher base, right? The, the way sub is set up is very heavy finisher base, but it it has a lot of mechanics around that, whereas we don't really. But I think, sure, I would like Rip to be a bit stronger, I guess, ideally, but I don't think it's like a massive... massive yeah, I think the rotation plays pretty similarly regardless. So yes. for me, the damage breakdown isn't that important. It's more how the rotation plays. Yes, I think that's the big thing for me. Like when people talk about the dot build or whatever, it's not... I don't just want to look at my details and see dot do like 100% of my damage if I'm still playing BFA Sabretooth, for example. Like if you made um, Ferocious Bite deal uh, bleed damage or you made Ferocious Bite uh, play a tick of rip, then it would increase the dot damage, but it wouldn't really change how you're playing around dots. And that's what sort of really matters to me is the sort of the play style of it. Yeah, um, for sure. I do agree that finishers are probably rather overvalued at the moment i think that's actually a problem in terms of like interability balance because it skews off a load of like talents so talents yeah. like saber tooth are inflated talents like center blood are massively deflated a moment of clarity are deflated and um, solar forces or inflated compared to sr yeah. as well yeah for the same reason um i i do think that's actually more the problem with feral than doing too much damage it's finishes in general being too much of our damage and generators not being now of course if you do that you don't have the risk of ending up in a um i can't remember the name of the tier Antorus, the burning throne feral oh tier, yeah great where you just cast shred and shred is the button you care about um so you do need to reach a balance there but i think that's been the core of feral's issues for a while is um finishes versus generators as opposed to ferocious bite versus rip um, that's fair enough. Um, I think we've sort of covered that. So the next question, which was actually kind of an interesting one, was if you're approached by Blizzard to design a new spell or mechanic for Feral, what would it be? So I think both you and I have done like theoretical Feral redesigns for ourselves yeah. at some point. <laughs> so hopefully we have answers yeah. to this. I've done multiple approaches to yeah. like this is a complex super complicated question because it depends what you think that ability is supposed to do like is it supposed to be uh you know we're getting 10 more levels and we want a new ability you know that just adds to the irritation or is it more like do you want to change something fundamental right because it's very very different um what type of mechanic you would design. So for example, if I were to rework Feral, I would want to focus a lot on snapshotting and you would have to make snapshotting a bit more intuitive, for example. And that would be require significant changes likely, right? Potentially um, system-wide game changes in order to make snapshotting. Yeah, better. certainly certainly would be a very interesting um, rework. It would be a very different spec from now. But if you're saying, oh, what would you design if you were just adding in a new ability? Ah, that's a, that's a tough question. And I honestly don't know, but I think I think if 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 I had to do one like random fantasy rework thing, I would rework Trash and Brutal Slash, and I would basically merge the two abilities because I think uh, Trash feels super underwhelming when it does basically zero damage, and I don't think Brutal Slash has a much of a. It it also feels a bit bland when it's so short cooldown and relatively low damage like it is now. It used to be way better before, feel way better before when it was more actually birthday we. So I think I would probably merge them and change a little bit. Um, that's probably what I would do. Uh, yeah. Right yeah, now. so much the same. So when I did my look at a rework, it was all around making Feral Druid, like making Cap Form, heavily, heavily single target, pure only, with almost no AOE. So almost the only AOE came from Cleave, and then having Bear Form as like an AOE stance, which did extremely low single target but had high AOE. Um, but in terms of just adding a new ability, I do agree with Thrash and Brutal Slash. I think we've talked about that before, and how Thrash is just... It just feels like a holdover of previous expansions. Um, but if I was just to add like a single new spell or mechanic without sort of reworking everything, I think I'd, an, another finisher would probably be where I'd go. Uh, maybe something like Iron Jaws, sort of a play on that. Um, a sort of situational potentially proc-dependent finisher um, yeah. is probably where I'd go. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people just like the idea of an AoE direct damage finisher. I'm not sure if that adds too much gameplay, but maybe. Like, I'm not opposed to it. I would have to feel how that feels, but... Yeah. That's an interesting thing to add, for sure. Like... I mean, I guess if you just don't care about reality, you could say, oh, I would just uh, make a symbiosis-like thing. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is the having to consider the context of the game in general. Um, right. So next two questions are kind of similar. Um, so the first one is, what does Feral bring to a raid? Um, in term... So I know people say that Feral doesn't have utility. And... I think that view is in terms of looking at the fact that the druid class in general brings a lot of the utility that feral brings, which is reasonable. When we look at classes in general, feral has a decent amount of utility. It doesn't have a whole lot of mandatory utility. It doesn't have a 5% damage buff. It doesn't have uh, anti-magic zone and a 20% magic damage reduction AOE. Um, but I do think that it's reasonable to say that feral brings a decent amount of stuff. Savage, not Savage Raw, Stampeding Raw is nice. Um, we're reasonably strong defensively. Um, with Convoke the Spirits in particular, there's the potential to be able to half the world convoke big healing cooldowns because it is a reasonably chunky healing cooldown. Um, so I think Feral brings stuff. It doesn't bring anything mandatory, but I think if you are a good player and you can output the damage, typically. I know melee spots are hard to find in raids, but typically there's at least a couple, three, four melee spots which are, are DPS based, outside of fights which are heavily, heavily ranged focused. So I think if you can perform damage wise, then Feral has a spot in raids. And I think Meowing showed that last tier when he finished at World 25 or something. And I think there's a variety of players who've shown that, that you can perform at that level maybe you can't perform at world first level but frankly there's what like 60 realistically world first players in the world so it's not the end of the world if feral isn't one of those and i i also think um something that is a bit underrated for feral is that in a lot of situations because we have strong mobility uh, we have I know people meme about bleeds, but they're still relatively strong. So we have over time damage, you know, when you're off target. Like, I think Feral actually is a lot of the time pretty easy to do damage with in r real raid fights. Like, it doesn't have any, like, glaring, super bad fights, very rarely at least, compared to other, um, particularly other melee specs, where there can sometimes be a fight where most melee specs are bad, but you as Feral are like, yeah, but, you know, solid middle of the pack, maybe a bit over middle of the pack, you know. Just because our uh, mobility, which is our passive mobility, is amazing, we have relatively strong personal ability and stuff like this allows you, and we have some ray extra range as well, allows you, you know, to actually do okay if you're good at the game, right? And and I think that's it's a bit of an underrated advantage actually. Is why I think some people can manage to, you know, play feral at a relatively high level, even though the average respect isn't that high, because. Yeah, if you're actually good at doing DPS, then Fel has a lot of tools to allow you to, to actually do DPS in practice, which uh, I think is underrated. While I think Feral doesn't bring anything mandatory, uh, I do think it brings stuff. And I don't think you should yeah. be concerned about not being able to find a raid spot. I managed to do it, and I'm a clown, so... I think, uh, yeah, I, I really do think most of the time, if you're struggling to find a raid spot, then... It can be that it's like a super undertune, but it is very rarely been like that. It's, yeah, sure, maybe you need to be better than a Warlock player, but that, that really shouldn't be... You shouldn't compare yourself and be like, oh, I want to put the same effort as everyone else. Like, that's that's just a road to, to disaster where everything is identical. That's not what you want anyway. Like, if you're playing Fell, get good enough that you can play at the level you want, you know? And if that's a different amount of skill or whatever, abstractly, than some other spec, you know... So be it. You're playing this because you enjoy it, I hope. Like, not just because you think it's, like, the easiest way to do max DPS, because in that case, sure, go and reroll whatever is the easiest way to do max DPS right now. That's always going to change. So, yeah. It really depends what your goal is. And if you want to be realm, uh, realm first, sorry, world first raider, you probably need to play, like, multiple specs anyway, realistically, if you want to get to that level. So, you know. Yeah. Right. So... This might be a bit of a bugbear for Zan because I know he hates the S word. 
Um, oh god. <laughs> does feral scale badly? The answer to this is probably just a resounding no. Yeah, yeah, but... yeah. Uh, scaling is a super complicated topic yes. that most people just completely abuse. So scaling, what is scaling? Do you mean in some, or will we be always be better at the end of an expansion, like people say? Like that narrative is just not true. So typically, Feral doesn't scale amazingly. It's not like old days where like warriors, for example, always got better because they got more rage from damage taken or whatever. Like that used to be a real scaling thing. That doesn't really, nothing like that applies to Feral. But at the same time, we don't have like any massive scaling issues that just cause it to be like, oh yeah, other specs is going to go ahead because we don't scale with weapon damage or whatever. Like it used to be as well. Like we don't have any of those anymore. Like haste isn't bad. Sure, it may not be the best stab, but it's not bad. Mastery isn't bad. Crit isn't bad. Issues now. Yes. It, it really does. Like don't assume that, oh, Feral is bad now, so, but it's going to be good at the end of the expansion. Like that's not really true. That 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 really isn't true. Whether if it's bad now, it may or may not end up being good next year, but that's gonna depend on Blizzard what Blizzard does. Like if they introduce new mechanics, like they typically do, you know, borrow power can affect a lot of things. Or if they buff us, or you know, whatever, right? Or different fights. So it's not as easy as oh, it will always be good at the end and always bad at the beginning. I I don't know why people think that's true, but it's it just I don't even think that historically makes sense. That's a lot of also time, changed a lot. Yeah. So in the past specs that had a lot of stat interactions like say fire mage um, or yes arguably feral um did scale better over expansions because you've got more stats nowadays you don't really get a whole lot more stats over the expansion excluding this last tier where borrowed power kind of went insane and we all just randomly had 100 percent crit that that isn't how expansions historically historically go. Yeah, it's worth saying that's not scaling. Yeah, stats. like the what happened last year isn't scaling. It's Blizzard just introduced a random bunch of mechanics that didn't exist, and they changed and they had some impact on what quote unquote scaling is, right? But that scaling would never happen normally. And similarly, like oh, energy, but energy is always better than the expansion. Oh, a lost expansion stats contribute a very small chunk of the extra energy, but it's like oh, we introduced for, yeah, a bunch of essences that give you energy. Right? Like, um, or before that, we introduce a set bonus to give you more energy or something like this. Like, a lot of the time, that is what happens. It's not really about scaling, so. And another thing people miss about scaling is that scaling is a function of your base DPS. If at the start yeah. of the expansion, you do more DPS, you're going to scale better because stats are a percentage increase. So you're going to get more stats. It's going to increase that base number, which is larger by more you're going to scale better despite doing more damage at the start of the expansion. And also and don't don't be foolish enough to use stat weights to try and like guess scaling and stuff like I've seen some people do. That's just that yes. that no. That it doesn't mean what you think it means if you think that indicates anything about scaling. Because it doesn't. It's it's a bit more you need a bit more um put a bit more effort in to actually do that analysis. Yeah. And the last question, we have touched on this a little bit actually, is Sunfire in AoE. Um, going boom conform, pressing sunfire, it's probably going to be worth on certain target counts. Yeah, uh, it would be uh, because Fell has a lot of downtime and on AOE, obviously, auto attacks. So, okay. I guess it's worth bringing this up because it's a bit of a big topic. So, first of all, Moonfire, Caster Moonfire, not Lunar Inspiration Moonfire, right, yeah, um, takes you out of cat form. However, it does not reset your auto attack. Because of bear uh, Yeah, because it's a primary guardian ability as well as um, caster ability. But that means that if you do swap to caster form and back, you only lose, uh, well, you lose much less auto attacks than you would, for example, if you're swapping to Moonkin form and then casting Sunfire. So this is a big difference. So it is extremely worth to Moonfire weave. Um, by extremely worth, I'm not saying that if you are really uncomfortable with playing Feral, that this is something you should do. This is like a last percent type optimization yeah. when you have the rotation done. But it is basically free. So first of all, just attaching Moonfire to your Target Fury macro causes you to, and you also need a Cancel Aura to make it semi-consistent because of bugs uh, with uh, stance bars, but will like, cause you to swap to, to uh, Custom Form, cause Moonfire, and then immediately swap back to uh, Cat Form with the TF, because TF puts in Cat Form and it's off global cooldown. This is basically free DPS if you do it. Um, you lose 
a partial global uh, of TF uptime, but it is negligible. So this just gives you a bunch of free DPS. And even when you have zero downtime, so when you're pooling and there's no drawback, you need to be sure that there's no drawback from wasting a global, but a lot of the time that is true. You can swap out and cast custom move and then immediately back in cat form, and that's a DPS increase, right? I will probably post something more specific about this, but this is a thing worth knowing about, I guess, that this is actually a DPS increase. Um, Sunfire. So for Sunfire, the difference is it always cancels your auto attack, which means you lose a bunch of auto attacks. Um, this is also super complicated for no reason, but what happens is when you leave cat form, your next auto attack is still a queued cat form auto attack. So it has the cat form attack speed. It will use uh, your cost of weapon DPS, but it will you um, swing with cat form speed. However, when it queues the next auto attack, even if you swap back into cat form, if you have queued uh, a, a caster weapon auto attack, it will now do the full caster, which is like three plus seconds time before it autos. So you lose a bunch of auto attacks as a TLDR from doing this. Uh, and those auto attacks means you lose energy from Omen procs and, of course, the damage. Um, so that means uh, it is not super straightforward to estimate the exact number where it's worth casting Sunfire, but it is very likely that that number is exists. I think it's around four in downtime, which is definitely worth it with Balance Affinity, of course. Um, so, yeah, worth keeping in mind. As for like breaking stealth with Sunfire and stuff, like that's just super. It's not that important that it is the first global. Don't don't overcomplicate this. It's really unnecessary. You swap out when you're pulling energy and cast Sunfire on like big AOE. That is worth it, yes. At like, if it's like a 20 AOE pull, it's definitely worth it, by the way. You don't need to think too much about it. If it's like three or four targets, I will get back with the exact number, but it is somewhere under. Um. Which does, of course, influence balance affinity being a DPS talent, but that shouldn't be a surprise. We mostly it, want it balance affinity. It basically regardless. always has been. Yeah, it yeah. basically, in practice, have always been a DPS yeah. talent. So yeah. It's just this way. Cool. Right. Well, I think we've actually gotten pretty much everything. Um, yeah. I think we've gone through a lot of stuff. Um, thanks for everyone who submitted questions. We got a fuck ton of them. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them, but it's just not practical. Unless we and a lot of show, um, just answering questions. And a lot of questions are like very technical ones, like for example, how many targets do I do this, etc. Uh, all of that will be published in guides, and I will probably publish a separate little thing on DreamGrow in a pin in, in a few days with the exact details on that type of stuff. So, so uh, we won't answer that. But... Everyone goes in Shadowlands, enjoy themselves. Um, it's always a fun time at the start of each expansion. Um, San and I are going to be leveling together. Yeah, so it's exciting. That will be fun. Um, and we'll see everyone after the next round of hotfixes, which will almost certainly be coming. Because Blizzard just love their hotfixes. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and see you next time.